Well, we've been on a series uh, the last few weeks talking about faith. We've called this series Manifest Breakthrough. And the reason we call it Manifest Breakthrough is when you go home today, you don't have to break into your house, do you? Why? It belongs to you. It's your house. It's where you live. You have keys. You have access, right? And the kingdom of God is the same way. You're not trying to convince God. You're not having to break through to get something. All the blessings of God already belong to you. Well, somebody said, well, why if all the blessings of God already belong to me, why am I not experiencing them in this area or that area? That's what faith does. It receives what Jesus has already paid for in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He did the heavy, heavy lifting, and so now we get to receive freely with what he provided for us to have. Isn't that great news? So faith is not like moving into works and trying to work our way into something. That's not what faith is. Faith is knowing what belongs to you and freely receiving it, and it's easy. Everybody say, it's easy. easy. It is easy. And just quickly reviewing the main points that we've covered so far. Number one, faith is being fully persuaded to the point of confident expectation. Quick question. How many of you believe that God is faithful to perform his promises, what he said he'll do. How many of you believe that? Okay, how many of you can say glory to God? Then you have strong faith. That's what Abraham did. He believed what God said, and he said glory to God. If you can do those two things, you've got enough faith to receive all the promises of God. Isn't that easy, and isn't that great news? I like easy things. I like easy things. Number two, faith takes And possesses the promises of God now. So you're not going to get saved someday. You're not going to get healed someday. You've got to decide today is the day that I'm going to receive my healing. Today is the day that I'm going to confess Jesus as my Lord. And when you do that, today is the day that it happens and you receive it. So faith doesn't wait. Faith goes to taking things now. Faith is not passive. Faith is proactive. Can you say, I'll take it. Let's try that again. I'll take it. I'll take it. That's it. That's, now, somebody, somebody, you know, people get into this idea that, well, you're being greedy. No. <laughs> it's not greedy to take what belongs to you. It's not greedy. What? <laughs> Jesse Duplantis told this story, and I loved it. I think Ivan shared it a few weeks back, how Jesse Duplantis walked into this store as a Disney store, and he just loved what he saw. He loved all the kids there, and he just went up to the cash register and said, I'm just buying everything in the store. It's all sold, every single item. I'm buying it now. And then he made an announcement to the kids. Go ahead and take whatever you want. It's all already paid for. Is it greedy to take when it's already been paid for? No, God wants you to have it. He wants you to have his blessing so much he already paid for him. Matter of fact, if we don't receive what Jesus paid for, for us, his blood was shed in vain. And I don't want one drop of the blood of Jesus to be shed in vain for me or this church. I want every one of you walking in everything he paid for because you're going to be real happy and you're going to be really good advertising. Everybody's going to want to find out about this good shepherd that we serve, right? The next thing is, number three, we're moving right along here. I'm going to get to my message. The strength of faith is contingent on two things. The promise of God and the integrity of the one who made the promise. You know, you could go up to an atheist and quote a promise of God's word and they would laugh. Why? They don't know the author and they don't know his integrity. But for us who know him and know how good he is and how faithful and how he watches over his word to perform it, you can take every promise of God to the bank. Amen? The promise of God and the character of God. And then we found out that the faith of God... Uh, works in uh, faith originates in the heart and is a product of what you give your attention to. So we have a choice of what we meditate on, what we ponder, what we think. We have we can spend time reading God's word, meditating on God's word, putting the word on the inside of us, and when we do that, faith activates in our heart. And the word of faith, Paul said, the word of faith, which 
we preach is in your mouth and in your heart. What's that mean? It, first it gets in your heart by meditating and then it comes out of your mouth and you decree what God has promised you because the promises get on the inside and your mouth is the overflow of what's in the heart. Anytime you have, think you have a mouth problem, you don't have a mouth problem, you actually have a heart problem, right? If you're saying the wrong things out of your mouth, it's just a reflection, the, the speech is a reflection of the heart, right? And so if we find ourselves saying the wrong things, we just need to change the input and the Bible says we can store up treasure in our heart and we can decree a thing and it will be established. So the God kind of faith works in the heart and you can have doubt in your mind, but the faith of God still work for you in your heart. Isn't that good news? Your, head, your, your heart will go places your head can't follow. <laughs> Amen. At times, it's like your head will go, what? <laughs> Raise the dead? But your heart will go, yeah. Yeah. You can raise the dead, right? Okay, that brings us to today. And I believe today's message is one of those messages that could cause you to miss an early death. This is a message that can get your body healed. This is a message that will cause your life to turn around 180 degrees if you get a hold of what's being released today. Amen? And this is the fifth point. Faith calls into existence The things that do not exist. Faith calls into existence. Can you say this out of your mouth? Faith faith calls into existence the things that do not exist. Now you may wonder, well, how on earth are you going to call things into existence that do not exist? Well, it's real simple. Scientists have discovered, finally, Took them a long, long time to catch up with God. That's usually how it works, right? They've discovered that the building blocks of all matter and every, everything that we see is made of molecules. And then they discovered the molecules are made of atoms. And then they discovered the atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And then they discovered those protons, neutrons, and electrons are made of quarks. And to the best that they can discover from there, there is a a unified theory that says uh, that, that matter responds to the voice and that, that sound waves are involved in creation and string theory and it's all tied together so that God spoke and here comes quarks and protons, neutrons, and electrons and atoms and molecules and everything that you see so that what was made was made of things which you cannot see. And then God invites you and me into this process and says, Hey, guys, imitate me. Jesus said it this way, have the faith of God. So we're going to look at this today. This may be something that you're unfamiliar with, but you're already doing this all the time in your life, in the natural realm. You just need to learn to do it in the spiritual realm, and it'll revolutionize the results you get in your life. I'm telling you, this is a way to call the things into your life that you want in your life that God has promised in his word, and he's made some awesome promises. So let's get this in the word of God. Romans chapter 4, verse 17 will be our theme scripture for the day, although it's likely we may cover some other scriptures <laughs> if you've been here very long. Romans four seventeen says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Now, let's stop for a second. God is speaking to, to Abraham, right? He said, I've made you a father of many nations. This is a promise made in uh, the book of Genesis to Abraham. And God said, I've made you a father of many nations when Abraham had no kids. Zero. So God was calling the thing which be not as though it already were, as though it already had happened. Isn't that interesting? So let's go on to read this. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. God calls things that do not exist as though they did. This is God's method of you releasing heaven on earth. This is how Christians are supposed to release heaven on earth. You may have never heard this today. All I ask is that you listen to the word of God and hear me out because I have experienced this in my life, and I've seen the results of it, and it works. And we see God doing it. We see Jesus doing it. We see the apostles doing it. You're already doing it in your natural life. Bring it into your supernatural life. 
The ERV translation said, God speaks of things that don't yet exist as if they are real. The ESV says he calls into existence the things that do not exist. The Moffat translation, he's a God who calls into being what does not exist. Finally, the Young's literal says, and is calling the things that be not as being. Okay. So reading this passage, we, we learn a couple of things here. Number one, God is against death. We know that, right? Death is an enemy. He calls the dead things to life, doesn't he? Jesus messed up every funeral he attended, and, and everybody who was dead came back to life, didn't they? He's like, you're not going to die around me. I'm going to raise you from the dead every single time. So he, he messed up every funeral he went to. God is against death. Now, what does that mean? God is against death in any area of your life. If there's any, think of your life now. If there's any area of your life, what would death look like? Maybe there's an area of your life where healing hasn't come into your physical body. Maybe there's a financial problem in your life where it looks like your finances are dying or they're not, they're not thriving and succeeding. It could be any area of your life that doesn't look like heaven. God want, has, he wants it to change, but he's given you the power to change it. He's given you the power. Isn't that great news? Number two, God calls those things which do not exist as though they did. And so we're going to talk about that. So faith is exercising your spiritual authority in the covenant promises of God to change your surroundings and circumstances by decrees of faith. If it's a natural, temporal thing, it is subject to change. 2 Corinthians 4 talks about while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporal, which means subject to change, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, all of us live in the realm of the five physical senses our whole life. And so we get the idea that our five physical senses, what we can see and taste and touch and smell and all these different things and feel, all these things, that's the real things. And here, but listen, the Bible says that's not the, re, the realest, that's not a good word, but that's not what reality really is, Right? Because everything you can see was made from a more powerful realm, the realm of the kingdom of God, the spirit realm, and is subject to the authority and power of that realm. And Jesus said, I'm handing you the keys of the kingdom of God to unlock and release heaven on earth and change your life. Change your circumstances. This is so awesome. Because... The Bible says, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he say, saith or says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Mark eleven twenty three, And I read that, and I start thinking this, whosoever whatsoever, whosoever, whatsoever. The faith of God will work for anyone. It'll work for any person. It doesn't matter if you're high IQ or low IQ. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what part of the city you live in. There's nobody that can stop you. The faith of God will work for whosoever. Are you a whosoever? Then it'll work for you. But not only that, the faith of God will work on whatsoever. It'll work on anything. It doesn't matter if it's a natural thing, if it's a thing that you can perceive with your five physical senses, it'll work on it. It'll change it. It'll transform it. The faith of God will work for anybody, and it'll work for anything, and it's available to you right now today. Isn't that good news? I am thankful that God... <laughs> and Mark, when, when, when they asked how Jesus, how, how he cursed the fig tree, that he said, oh, that was the deity trick. 
that I, I, I learned with the Father in eternity past, and don't try this at home. It's, it's not for, for you. <laughs> you, just do, you just learn to suffer through whatever you're going through. That's not what he said. He said, hey, guys, come here. Let me show you how this kingdom works. Let me show you what I just did, and I invite you to do what I did because you can do it. It'll work for anybody. It'll work on anything. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Romans 4.17 even God who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were, calls those things. Faith calls things. Faith calls things. So we're going to talk about this. So we are not to be like a thermometer. We've got three thermometers and thermostats in this room. Now, some people pride themselves that they're gifted to detect the atmosphere and what's going on. That's nice that you can do that. And, and, and that's part of our spiritual gifting, and that's available to a believer, to have a level of discernment and perception to perceive what's going on around you in the atmosphere. But that's not, that, that isn't where you should stop. Because God hasn't called you to be a thermometer. He's called you to be a thermostat. See, the thermostat has something called a goal setter. What is that? Well, if it's, 65 degrees in here, and we want it to be 72 degrees, we set the goal setter for 72 degrees, and we call for 72 degrees, which delivers the heat until the temperature rises from 65 to 72 degrees. We don't call it as it is, we call it as we want it to be, right? In your life, don't accept what is if it is contrary to what is available from the redemption of Christ Jesus, and if it doesn't look like heaven, don't accept it. Start calling for what you want it to be based on God's promise. And there's so many promises that cover every area of life, there's nothing left out. Nothing. God's got a promise for everyone, everything, right? So faith calls for what it desires based on the promises of God. Jesus said, whatsoever things you desire... Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you take them and you shall have them. Notice he said the word desire, and yet so many people think uh, God is moved by need. God says, what is the desire of your heart? And, and it doesn't line up with the word of God. When you have holy desires and there's promises of God that back them up, Jesus is telling us, go after that. If you have a passion to see people's bodies healed, go after that desire. If you have a desire <clears throat> to prosper and be successful so you can be a blessing and bless your family and be a blessing to the kingdom of God, go after that, right? Amen. Don't love money, but use money in the service of the kingdom of God. Make it obey you. Make it serve you. How do you make money serve you? By giving. That's part of what the tithe does. When you take the tithe out of whatever you get, you're, you're making that money serve you. It could have been drug money. Now, don't be a drug dealer. <laughs> I'm not saying that. But it doesn't matter the history of the money. As soon as you take it and you tithe on it and you say, God, everything I have belongs to you, and you can recall it at any point and do whatever you want with it. When you'll live like that, God can trust you with some things. Amen? Because your heart isn't wrapped up in things. It's wrapped up in God. And how can I get the gospel out? That's your priority, right? That's our priority as God blesses us. But God gives us the power to call things that be not as though they were. Amen? Amen? 2 Peter 1.4 says, By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, right? Um, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now we have been, think of the promises of God, all the promises of his word. They're exceedingly great. They're precious, they're valuable, they're more valuable than silver or gold or diamonds or anything like that. They're the most valuable thing is the promises of God, right? Now, his promises, think about this, they're almighty, they're omnipotent promises. Why? Because his promises will release his kingdom to overshadow whatever's going on in your life. Right? 
In 2009, I crashed my motorcycle and broke my wrist pretty bad. And um, I didn't have a great plan in place. I just said, he forgives all my iniquities and he heals all my diseases. And I spent a few hours just muttering, he heals all my diseases. He heals all my diseases. He heals all my diseases. And within 24 hours, a miracle had taken place in my wrist. I received prayer that, that I broke it on Saturday. On Sunday morning, I received prayer. I didn't need the surgery, and I didn't have to wear a cast. That's a good deal, isn't it? And that's available for all of us. How did that happen? Real simple. Faith comes by hearing. I took the word of God, the promise I needed. I began to meditate on it and mutter, and faith got in my heart. And then I received anointed prayer, and <laughs> isn't it wonderful that faith is a team sport? There's a paralyzed guy, and they couldn't get into the meeting with Jesus, and so they ripped a hole in the roof about, they, they thought, well, they looked in the door, but they couldn't get to Jesus. They said, he's about 50 feet up there. So they climbed up on the roof, four guys with this guy on his, on his bed, on his couch, paralyzed. They took the chains, they walked up about 50 feet forward, cut a hole in the roof, and lowered the guy down in front of Jesus. And he says, man, your sins be forgiven you. And then all the Pharisees flipped their wig because who can forgive sins but God? And then, of course, Jesus released the kingdom and he got healed and said, aha, <laughs> right? Yeah. What's the point? Faith is a team sport. Everybody needs four crazy friends yeah. who know how to believe God with him. Amen? <laughs> it's, you know, it's not just your faith. If you surround yourself with the right people, you'll never have to go it alone. You'll have people holding you up. You'll have people strengthening you and releasing their faith with you to receive from heaven, right? Isn't that a blessing to have covenant relationships like that? They're precious and they're priceless. But we have omnipotent promises from God, almighty promises from God that are absolutely unstoppable. Um, Genesis 13, 14, this is about Abraham, and it says, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up now and look from the place where you are, north, south, east, and west, for all the land which you see, I will give you and your descendants forever. Now, this is a faith principle. You can have whatever you see. You can, and let me qualify this. See, Abraham's promised land was a physical land that he went up on a mountain and looked out, and that was his promised land. It was a physical promised land. Your promised land and my promised land are the new covenant promises of healing, of salvation, of deliverance, of joy, of prosperity, of peace, of fruitfulness, of destiny and purpose and an abundant life. That is our promised land. Those are the pro and whichever one of those promises that you see, you can have because God's already said you can have it. He's already given you the green light. We're not trying to twist the, look, I don't have enough faith to convince God to do anything. I don't have to. He's already got promises of his word. Now, Joshua, he, he talked the Lord into, you know, stopping the universe so he could keep whipping somebody, right? That's pretty awesome. But hey, I do, have enough, I do have enough faith to look into the promises of God that I need for my life, for this ministry, and for what God wants to do, and believe those promises and mix faith and receive from heaven. How about you? Amen. You can do the same thing, can't you? So God was actually showing Abraham because he, right before this, God, Abraham had said to God, Lord, what will you give, it, give me seeing I go childless. Now, God had already promised Abraham that he'd be the father of many nations. But Abraham gave his belief system away in that statement, didn't he? He said, seeing, I go childless. What was he believing? He was believing sight. He was believing what he could see with his eyes. I don't see any child, so I'm childless, instead of seeing what God said. And so God said, I'm going to work with Abraham. He can't go to Romans 10, 17 and find out faith comes by hearing. He can't go to James and find out releasing your, he doesn't have all these scriptures. I got to work with this guy, and I'm going to make him a prototype, a forerunner of every Christian, a father for every Christian that ever comes after that, right? That's you and me. Abraham's our father, right? <laughs> Amen. And so God says, Abraham, it's nighttime. Go outside. Look up. Can you number the stars? Abraham's like, no. 
God's like, so shall your seed be. Takes him out in the daytime to the beach. Hey, Abraham, look at the sand of the shore. Can you count the sand of the shore? Nope. So shall your seed be. So God began to give visual images to Abraham to stimulate his faith so he could see an example of what God was going to do and the promise of God before him in his life. Because words transmit images, don't they? If I say the word kangaroo, (laughs) you're thinking of Australia and one of those big rats with a pouch, right? (laughs) If I think of hippo, (laughs) you might be thinking of that game, Hungry Hungry Hippo, in order to... You know, I'm thinking of something else, a video that Levi showed me one time, but I don't want to see it. talk about that here today. And then uh, zebra. <laughs> what do you think about? The stripes, right? The zebra stripes. So words actually transmit images. Part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to inspire hope in you. The Bible says in Romans 15, 13, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Did you know when you are worshiping and spending time with God and praying, you can see visions, and you'll see visions of your future in your, in your, in your sanctified imagination. So your imagination is not of the devil. God made your imagination. And your, 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 uh, your imagination becomes a projector screen of the promise of God. In other words, you meditate on the promise and you see it in your imagination. What would it look like if I was prosperous? What would it look like if I can't walk, I'm walking again, right? What What would it look like if I'm blind? What would it be like to see? All these things you go through and you begin to meditate on the word of God and the promise of God and they create an image on the inside of your, of your imagination and you begin to see the promises of God. And the, and the Bible principle is whatever you see, you can have. That's the power of the word. When you meditate on it, you get it on the inside and you can see it on the inside. And once you can see it on the inside, glory to God, you can decree it and you're gonna see it on the outside. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. So God told Abraham, look at the stars, look at the sand. And then Job twenty two twenty eight says this, You will declare a thing. You will also declare a thing, and it will be established for you, so light will shine on your ways. You're a king, right? According uh, to the book of Romans, chapter 5 and verse 17, we are kings, right? According to Revelation chapter 1, we're kings and priests. Kings decree things, right? Right? Because they have absolute sovereign authority in their territory, in their life, right? They have the power to decrease, de- make a decree and change their kingdom, the place they live, the realm they exist in. You have the power. Part of the place that you have authority over is your physical body. You have authority over your physical body to speak and decree a thing over your body, to speak and decree healing and divine health and drive sickness out of your body, right? That's one of the areas. Um, Here's one of the things that Christians do uh, is they call things that be as though they be. They call the thing that already is. What would that look like? Well, if you're sick, that would look like, well, I'm sick. Well, I'm sick. I'm sick. (laughs) What are you doing? You're calling the thing that, you're not calling the thing which be not as though they were. You're calling the thing which be as though it be. But yeah, I'm sick. Now, here's here's something to understand. Faith does not deny fact. So some people try and approach faith like this. I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick. If you've got a fever and you're sick and you say I'm not sick, you're actually just lying. You're not exercising faith. Now you could say this, I command these lying symptoms of sickness and disease, get out of my body in the name of Jesus. And I I lose healing in my physical body from the top of my head to the soles of my feet and divine health and I refuse to permit sickness and disease in my life. Now, that's a good prayer. That's a prayer of you exercising authority to kick out what doesn't belong to you and to release heaven into your body, right? That's that's what we're to do. And so 
De- don't declare how it is, but declare it how you want it to be. Um, let's see here. Th- this is, see, I-, I told you guys earlier, everybody already does this, right? Everybody does this. So let's, let's illustrate this for a moment. Let's say you have a big, uh, big backyard, you live out on a farm, and you have a lot of acres, and you have a dog out on the farm somewhere in the backyard. And so you walk outside, it's time to feed the dog. And you walk out, and you set the food down, and you look around, and you say, the dog's not here, the dog's not here, the dog's not here, the dog's not here. Do you do that? It'd be a little silly, wouldn't it? The dog's not here, the dog's not here, the dog's not here. Your neighbor walks over and says, what are you doing? Well, the dog's not here. I just call it like I see it. The dog's not here, the dog's not here, the dog's not here. Right? Right. You could say, the dog's gone, the dog's gone, the dog's gone, and that'd be the doggone truth, right? (laughs) Now, God doesn't want us, it doesn't do any good to call it out as it is. If you're broke, it doesn't do you any good to say, I'm broke. (laughs) <laughs> you already are broke. It's obvious. That doesn't help you, right? No, what you need to do is call for what you want. So what do you do with the dog? Everybody already does this. The dog's not here, so what do you do? Here, dog, <laughs> right? <laughs> Whatever your dog's name is. You call for your dog. You call for what you want. You don't call it as it is. You call it as you want it. Everybody does this, right? So faith uh, and then faith doesn't lie about it and say, the dog's here when the dog's not here. The dog's here and the dog's not there. No, you call for what you want. Faith calls for what you want to be. You're calling something into existence to wipe out what already exists that you want to eliminate. So if there's sickness in your body, you're calling healing into existence because you have the power to do that, right? And so you're calling, you're calling things and you're not calling it as it is, you're calling it as you want it to be. So you're calling things into existence. You have the power to do this. I have the power to do this, right? You know, does God do this? Well, there was a day that we read about in Genesis chapter 1, before there were actually days, <laughs> before there was time, space, or matter, when God stood on the brink of nothing in the middle of, of aching void, and he didn't say, There's nothing here, there's nothing here, there's nothing here. He didn't call it like it was, did he? He called what he wanted. He called for light. And what happened? There was light. He was showing us how this works. Call for what you want. Don't call it as it is. Call for what you want. You have the the power to call things and change things, right? Now, where is this in the Bible? Where's another example? This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. It says this. For you see your calling, brethren, this is a good scripture, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Everybody say amen, he's talking about me. (laughs) That's a good humbling verse, isn't it? Verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. You know, there's a lot of people that despise the message of faith that I'm preaching today. Here's why they despise it. Because as soon as you talk about this, it eliminates no-fault religion. What is no-fault religion? That's where we can just say, we don't understand why that happened. It's just the sovereignty of God. God's a big God. He does whatever he wants. And that, that's just the way it is. And praise God. Now, here's the thing about that. There are things that all of us will experience in life that are difficult, that'll, that, are, that are troubling. And there'll even be times maybe you ex- exercise your faith to the best of your degree and you didn't get the result that you hoped would, would happen. Maybe for somebody else. I've prayed for people and, and it didn't turn out the way I've wanted it. I've decreed and spoke and spent hours in prayer and, and releasing the kingdom of God and still see, see, at times th- seen uh, the result that I wanted didn't happen. You know what I do with that stuff? I take it and I put it in the cloud. Because if I focus on what hasn't happened, I'll stop my faith and, and stop the kingdom of God in its tracks. But I, what I do is I focus on all the good results that have happened. 
I focus on the miracles that have happened, the resurrections that have happened, the salvations that have, that have happened, right? I focus on that. That's how I encourage myself, and that's how I, I keep moving forward in the kingdom of God, right? But he says, God has chosen and the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen and the things which are not. What are the things that are not? the things that don't exist, that you can't see, to bring to nothing the things that are. So that means there's something you can see in the visible realm, and God says there's something in the unseen realm that you can call into existence because it really does exist already in the unseen realm, right? And it will change the seen realm. Now, think about this in Scripture. Do you remember when um, the children of Israel were leaving Egypt and they're on the banks of the Red Sea, and it looks like they're toast. The Egyptian army's coming up behind them. They're done. What are they going to do? They're going to all get slaughtered, right? And God says, Moses, stretch out your rod over the sea. And guess what? His rod released spiritual power. Question, what was more powerful? The two billion pounds of water or the spiritual power? The spiritual power moved over two billion pounds of water. I did the math on it one time. It's over two billion pounds of water that were moved out of the way for the children of Israel to walk right through the Red Sea, right? Two billion pounds. So we look at like an ocean and go, oh, nothing could move that ocean. No, God's power can change anything. And the lights won't blink in heaven. <laughs> God won't go, oh my gosh, how are we going to do that? He, he, won't even, he won't even have to like flex his, his pinky, you know? It would be like nothing. There's nothing that we do or say or release with all of our faith that is difficult for heaven to receive, right? Or heaven to, to bring to pass. So the things that, that are, are the observable reality in your life and mine. That's the things that are. God uses things which are not things which are currently unobservable to bring to nothing things which currently are. So we're getting this method, right? This is God's method of releasing faith. So this means that things which are unseen have power to change the scene regardless of the current conditions. The unseen kingdom of God, the realm of the spirit, God's power has power to change anything that's in the natural. It doesn't matter if it's called heart disease. It doesn't matter if it's called cancer. It doesn't matter what its name is. And if it has a name, there's a name above it, the name of Jesus. Right? So maybe in your life right now, something exists which is contrary to the word, will, and promise of God. That would probably be just about everybody in this room that there's something you're in the process of eliminating and moving out of your life that the enemy's tried to put in there. Right? Right? Somewhere, somehow. It could be sickness, it could be pain, it could be defeat, hopelessness, depression, poverty, unfruitful labor. You know what it is. The Bible calls these things mountains, doesn't it? But we can move mountains, can't we? So God uses faith in his promises, believed in the heart of man, and decreed and acted on to bring supernatural change and transformation to make your life look like heaven on earth. His, he wants your life and mine to literally look like heaven on earth. That's his will. So we never move the bar of the will of God based on our personal experience or lack thereof, do we? That's a grave mistake that some Christians make. They try and interpret the will of God based on their personal experience. The will of God is not subject to my personal experience. The will of God is forever settled in heaven. And what his word says and what heaven looks like, that is his will. Matter of fact, if you really want to find out what the will of God is, read Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Revelation 21, and Revelation 22. And in between are 1,185 chapters where sin, bad decisions, the devil, demons, and other things have affected and corrupted the ultimate will of God. When you look at those four chapters, you'll really see God's will, and it's really, really better than you and I can ask, think, or even imagine. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Um, if you need healing, you take a promise of God on healing and you meditate on it. He forgives all my diseases. 
He heals all my sicknesses and he forgives all my disease. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. And you start meditating on it. Faith comes into your heart. Then you begin to decree healing. I decree when my wrist was broken. I decree healing into my wrist. I decree the bones are going back together. I decree that I will not have to have the surgery because I'm healed by the power of God. Amen? You begin to decree something. Decree it and it'll happen. Amen? There was a time that I wanted a business. And so... I, I saw that I needed some money to have this business. And so I asked Holy Spirit, what, is, you know, what seed do I need to sow? And I felt like I needed to break a barrier in my sowing. So I sowed a bigger seed than I'd ever sowed. And you know, faith is specific. It's very specific. Faith is that you can't operate in faith and, and be real general and vague. God is not a general and vague God. One, one time, David Young E. Cho, who pastors the biggest church in the world, prayed for a bike and a desk He wanted a bike and a desk, and he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and decreed that he had a bike and a desk, but nothing was happening. And then he went to the Lord and said, Lord, what's going on? Why why are you not giving me the bike and the desk? You know, these are things I need for the ministry. And the Lord's like, you weren't specific. What kind of bike do you want? What kind of desk do you want? And so he said, okay, I got it. I see where I missed it. I wasn't specific. I wasn't specific. So he went and he said, I want this type of bike, and I want it to be this color, and I want this desk that's got this type of wood, and I want it to be so-and-so. And And he got super specific. Almost immediately, the desk and the bike just arrived into his life. He didn't buy them. They, They were given to him. They came into his life. Exactly what he was looking for because he was specific. God taught me about being specific. Um... Several different times, but one of the times was when I wanted a printing company, he, he dealt with me to sow an $1,100 seed, and I did that, and then the, the finances came in to get this business, and a few weeks later, I was praying up at the church on a Saturday night, just laying on the altar praying for the service tomorrow, and he said, hey, you never calculated um, the revenue stream on that lease to get that equipment that I, you know, that I did this miracle for you. I was like, okay. I, I didn't know why he was, he was talking to me about it. So I got the lease document out and I added the payments times the, the monthly payment times the number of months. And I found out it came out to exactly 100 times what I'd sowed. I'd sowed an $1,100 seed and I got a $110,000 harvest of finances. So here's the thing. Listen, God's kingdom is very specific and exact. It's not vague. It's not vague. And this is a mistake we can make in receiving from God when we're vague and not specific. Right? So be specific in your believing. Be specific in what you're, when the blueprint of your faith is what you're believing God for. You know, it wouldn't hurt you to write down what you're believing God for. I'm believing God. You know, if you're believing for a spouse, I'm believing for a spouse that loves Jesus, that's sold out, filled with the Holy Ghost, right? I guess, (laughs) filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Loves Jesus, has a passion for God, has a passion for the local church, has a passion for missions, whatever it is. You write those things down and you begin to say, thank you, Lord, for my spouse that has all these, and beautiful or handsome, don't leave that out, right? Amen. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Glory to God. So let's wrap this up. I know it's getting late. Um, Do we ever see Jesus or the Father ever operating in this? The answer would be yes, all the time. All the time. When? Okay, let's talk about the wedding feast at Cana of Galilee. They ran out of wine. Jesus said, hey, go fill the water pots, the wine pots, and fill them with water to the brim, brim, right? And they did it. They said, now draw out and take it to the governor of the feast. Wait a minute. It's, you're supposed to drink wine at the wedding, not water, right? But no, he was taking him water, but he was calling the water wine. And when the governor of the feast drank it, what was it? It was wine, wasn't it? First miracle of Jesus. What about the pool of Bethesda? The man at the pool of Bethesda. Uh, he's, he's sick. Uh, he's been there 37 years, can't get healed. Somebody gets in the water. When the angel troubles it, he can't get there. Jesus comes up, says, rise, take up your bed and walk. What did Jesus call him? He just called him healed. If you're paralyzed, you can't get up and walk. Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk. He was calling the sick healed, wasn't he? He was calling the sick healed. What about the man with the withered hand? 
And the Pharisees were getting mad at him because he was going to heal on the Sabbath. And this guy has this withered hand, and he can't stretch forth his hand. And Jesus says, stretch forth your hand. You can't stretch forth your hand if it's withered. It's impossible. What was Jesus doing? He was calling for the healing. And his hand came forth. What about the woman with the spirit of infirmity that was bowed over and couldn't raise herself up? Jesus said, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. Some said he lied. Because she wasn't. Not until he walked over and laid his hands on her, then she was made straight. He was calling for the healing before it even happened. He was calling those things which be not as though they were. We can go over and over and over through the scriptures, all through the scriptures, right? I want to finish with this. I'm not going to read the verses for time's sake. When God wanted Abraham to operate in faith and have his Isaac and become the father of many nations... Abraham had that promise for 24 years with absolutely no fruit, no manifestation, no results whatsoever. But God said, he can't read Romans chapter 10, verse 17. He can't read about faith in Romans chapter 4 about his story. You and I can. He couldn't. So God said, I'm going to do something. I'm going to manipulate the situation for the desired outcome, and I'm going to teach him something. God appears to Abraham and says, your name's not Abram anymore. It's Abraham. Instead of exalted father, your new name is father of many nations. Abraham's, okay, that's my new name. And so what happens? He has 318 hired servants. And every day they're like, hey, somebody just gave you a thousand more camels. Where do we put them, father of many nations? Hey, there's more gold that just came in. Where do we put the gold, father of many nations? The other, the other storehouses are overflowing. And, and <laughs> every day... All day long, he's here in his new identity, meditated into his spirit, father of many nations, father of many nations, father of many nations. And what happens within two months, two and a half months, hallelujah, Sarah's pregnant with Isaac. What couldn't happen for 24 years, even though the promise was in place, when Abraham began to meditate on the promise and shift his identity and believe in what God said, the promise came to pass. We'll finish with this story. This is uh, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth. And Zechariah is doing his sacrifice in the temple. It's his turn to sacrifice. And um, an angel appears to him. Now, Zechariah is very old. His wife's very old. They haven't had kids. They're barren, right? And all of a sudden, an angel appears to him and said, You're highly blessed and highly favored. And God is going to do a miracle in your old age. You're going to have a son. You're going to have John is going to be his name. John the Spirit-filled Baptist. (laughs) I just had to slip that in because he was Spirit-filled from his mother's womb. So he was a Spirit-filled Baptist. (laughs) Uh, I've just had a little fun there. But anyway, so this angel... I am Gabriel. Gabriel stands before John the Baptist, stands before him and gives him this message, right? And says, you're going to have a son. And Zechariah's like, well, how will I know this? What sign will you give me? (laughs) In other words, he was dealing with some heavy-duty unbelief. You know, sometimes when people have been through a situation for a long period of time that hasn't changed, it's hard for them to break out and believe that, right? Right? But God's still big enough to do whosoever for what, you know, whatsoever for whosoever, right? So we should realize that doesn't matter how long a current situation has been there, God can change it in a second. So here's what happened. He says, this is the fortune translation, dude, I am Gabriel and I stand in the very presence of God. And because you haven't believed it, you're going to be mute until the baby is born. Now, was God being mean to him? No, God was protecting his harvest. Because look, Zacharias never, ever would have been able to have the promise because he would have killed the promise with doubt and unbelief coming out of his mouth because he didn't believe the word. So God did him a favor and said, I'm going to hit the mute button so you can't kill this promise. And once the baby's born and they're like, what do we name the baby? Boom, his voice comes back and he says, his name is John. Amen? Isn't God awesome? Hallelujah. He protected the harvest. That's the kind of power and authority you and I have to call things. Why don't you stand on your feet right now? 
Why don't we call some things? Can we make a couple confessions together? Let's make some decrees. What, what are we doing? We're calling for what we want. If the dog's not here, what do you call for? You call the dog. Here, Pooch, here, Fido, you call the dog in, don't you? You call the dog to you. You don't say, the dog's not here, the dog's not here, the dog's not here, right? And when the dog's there, you don't say, the dog's there, the dog's there, the dog's there. What would that be saying? That would be saying, I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick. Sure, you're sick if you're sick, but faith does not deny the facts. That's denial, and denial is a river in Egypt. That's not how our faith works, right? Right? <laughs> No, how our faith works is we call for the thing which is not to take out the thing which is and the the kingdom of God, the power of God in the spirit realm is more powerful than anything that is of the curse, of of death, of the devil in the natural realm working in our life. God's kingdom is more powerful. So can you repeat after me? Heavenly Father, thank you that you've given me power. Dominion, Dominion. authority, Authority. and the faith of God. God. I'm a king king. in the kingdom of God. God. I have power power to decree decree. the word, the the will, will. the promise of God. God. I I speak over my salvation. I confess Jesus as my Lord. I believe in my heart. God raised him from the dead. Therefore, I'm saved. I decree over my body with long life. You're satisfying me and showing me your salvation. I decree you forgive all my iniquities and you heal all my diseases. Thank you, Jesus, that you came, that I might have life and that I might have it super abundantly, superior in quality. Thank you, Father. I decree prosperity, blessing, increase, favor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In my life. life. Glory to God. God. You said said, whatever I set my hand to to will prosper. prosper. Thank you, Father. Father. Everything I do do prospers, prospers, excels, excels, and succeeds. succeeds. Glory to God. God. Thank you, Father. That I'm rich in faith, rich in good works, that I'm a blessing going somewhere to happen. When I walk into an atmosphere, people get healed because I carry the glory of God. When I walk into an atmosphere, demons leave people's bodies. Creative miracles happen because I carry the king. Thank you, Father. I am a son of God. I'm full of joy. I'm full of peace. I have the spirit of faith. I'm victorious in every situation. Hallelujah all the time. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Say this with me. No man will be able to stand before me All the days of my life, as God was with Moses, he's with me. He'll not fail me. He'll not forsake me. He'll perform every word he promised. Thank you, Father. You're a good God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, you, Jesus. You're faithful, Lord. You're faithful, Lord. Now, I just saw I just saw a bunch of angels just go and take off. <laughs> you know why? Because they hearken unto the voice of his word. They're listening for somebody to speak the word of God. And when you speak the word of God, angels get activated. 
and they move out. And the angels just moved out. Where are they going? They're going to bring your words to pass. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for teaching us for, to call for the things that don't exist and call them into being in our lives because that is your method to release heaven on earth. So, Father, I just decree the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the minds of your people. They get this revelation and they begin to act on it in their life and their circumstances and the thing which, things which are in the scene that are contrary to your promises and your word begin to change and transform before them because they have the power of God to change their situation. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name, Lord.